All right, open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And as you know, we've been uh, going through, kind of verse by verse, we've been talking about our, our walk with God, right? That's the topic of the series, Walking with God. And uh, there's really nothing more important in our lives than our walk with our Lord. Uh, we want to have a right relationship. I think about my kids and how important it is for me to have a right relationship with them. I want a good relationship with my kids. More importantly, I want a good relationship with my wife. I want a good relationship with my staff. I want a good relationship with the folks in church. I want a good relationship as a whole, but the very most important relationship that we'll ever cultivate is one with God. And it's, it is the most important. And we can learn all that we need to learn about our right relationship from the Word of God. And so as we talk about walking with God, as we're going through 1 John, we're discovering how to walk in the light as He is in the light. And friends, I want to walk where my Savior is walking. When we, went, uh, when we go to Israel, it's always, it's always fun. Uh, someone at the table had asked me last night, we were sitting around, and they said, how many times have you been to Israel? I said, oh, I don't know, six, seven. It's like, whoa, really? <laughs> I like walking where my Lord walked. I like walking with my Lord. There's a, there's a song, and he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. Is that how you feel about your Savior? Do you like to walk and talk with him? I find that a very, it's a buzzword these days, the word authentic. We're looking for authenticity. We're looking for an authentic relationship. Somebody who's, who really has a right relationship, right? Or just authentic. We, like, we, we don't like counterfeit. I had, a, uh, I had a guy who came to church years and years ago. He came to my church after going to a, a, a much larger church. And I said to him, I said, why, do you, why, why aren't you going there? I mean, I, I don't get it. Why don't you go to that church? Much bigger. They got much bigger kids programs. And uh, they got much bigger facility, a lot more going on. And he says, I have a hard time going to a church where they talk about authenticity and the pastor wears a wig. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> I suppose that works. Yeah. Be authentic. I like an authentic relationship, one that's real. And when it comes to our relationship with God in cultivating that, walking in the light as he is in the light, I want to walk with my Savior. And I've challenged you before to at times just tell the Lord you love him. Just tell the Lord, you know, Lord, I love you. Just love on God. Tell him you love him. Have these these conversations as you drive. You know, I tell you, I've preached a lot of sermons from this pulpit, but I've preached a lot of messages over the dashboard of my car. I mean, the front of my dashboard is filled with spit from me shouting and hollering, getting excited. Are you authentic? Do you have a, a right relationship with God? Well, a, a right relationship, in, on one hand, is easy. It's just loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, strength. But there are things we can do to better that relationship. And as we talk about 1 John, and we get into chapter 2, we really have some neat things we can do and some commandments that we are to follow in, in really fostering a better relationship with God. And part of the better relationship with God is kind of knowing your adversary. It's knowing who you're up against, knowing the battle that's out there. We want to know, we want to know who we're fighting, right? I want to know who I'm fighting. I know there are teams who who sit down in a in in a locker room and and they they project on a screen that the 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 team that they're about to play. And whether it's baseball or football, and they want to see. The quarterback throw the ball. They want to see the running back run the ball. They, they want to see the, the wide receiver catch the ball. They want to learn. 
They want to learn the other team. Now, we, we, know, we know that there is uh, a real truth to just knowing the, the, the real thing. And you've all heard the illustration of the, of, of the bank teller. The guy comes in to the bank teller and says, Wow, you must, uh, you must uh, have studied a lot of counterfeits to be able to know uh, the real thing. And, and uh, the bank teller says, No, you just know the real thing well enough to be able to identify a counterfeit. But there's a blend. There just is a blend. It's knowing your adversary, but knowing your Lord. And, and knowing the tactics of your adversary. One of the things that the Christian is really battling, it really is the world. It's worldliness. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the Christian staying away from worldliness. It is compelling. It is compelling. It, it, it's, it's mesmerizing. It, it's like as if there was a, a watch in front of you. It's, 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 it's hypnotizing. The world is trying to get you to follow it. And God is trying to get you to follow Him. And so the first thing we look at really comes from 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. A commandment, a wonderful commandment, something we can do, something we can avoid. We want to avoid the pitfalls. Remember, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. Listen, if you see that you're going to twist your ankle, you step over the hole in the ground, right? So you, you see the problem and you, you depart from it. And this is one of the problems, the love of the world. Verse 15. John says this, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, this world that John is speaking of here is not referring to the earth per se. And you, some critics say, well, that doesn't make any sense because God, for God so loved the world... And here it is, God's loving the world and then telling us not to love the world, two different worlds. This is the cosmos. This is the world's system. The world's system is vile, it's corrupt. One commentator said that the world, conceived of as a, as a moral and spiritual system, is designed to draw humanity away from the living God, is profoundly seductive, and no Christian however advanced, is fully immune to its allurements. The whole purpose of the world is to, the system, is to draw us away from God's system. The world system is, our, is really powerful, very dangerous. It's drawing away the human race with its incessant enticements, constantly, constantly trying to get us away from God. That's what the world is doing. It offers us everything we've never had and everything we've always wanted. The commandment is to love not the world. Now, many Christians are really drawn away by what the world has to offer. Uh, the, the, the world seems uh, so tangible, doesn't it? The world, it seems so tangible, so material. It, it seems so real, you can see it and touch it and you have immediate reward for what you do. The opposite of that is the Word of God, the promises in the Word of God seem so, so remote. It's so far out there. God promises us eternal life, and in eternity we'll have rewards for the things that we've done on this earth. It seems so far out there, doesn't it? I mean, how do you get excited about running a race that... Quite honestly, you keep running and you just seem to never end. Just keep running. Just run the race. <laughs> With patience, of course. Now, you can't forget that. And run not as one that beat at the air. So run as fast as you can for as long as you can, and eventually you'll have a reward. It seems very hard as a Christian. Man, I tell you, it's like, are we ever going to get there? You ever been in a car drive, car ride, and you're just driving and you're just driving? I hate the dumb GPS because it says, I mean, you watch the miles tick down. 
350 miles left. And you're driving, you're driving, you're driving, and you're driving, and you're driving. And you look down, 344 miles left. And you're driving, and you're driving. You eat a bag of chips. You drink a thing of coffee. Look down, 339 miles. Like, I can't believe we're just, not, we're just never going to get there. And then if you have kids, it's, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Dad, how long till we're there? Now they just look at the GPS and they can see. <laughs> Son, don't ask me that again. Just look here. You see that? <laughs> this is what I'm going by. I'm just telling you what you see. Christians, they're, they're, they're drawn in by this world. You know, resisting the world is very, very hard for the Christian to do. It's very hard. It's our, one of our hardest adversaries. You know, that's why we have revival meetings. That's why we have revival meetings. That's why we have uh, 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 mission conferences, and we have church three times a week. And, and uh, I, I mean, that, that's why we have rededications. We've got to rededicate our life all the time. And, and a Christian who thinks that the only time they have to dedicate their life is at camp one time 70 years ago is really mistaken. The reason Paul died daily was this recommitment to God, continually recommitting. This isn't something that you do once. Friends, if you wake up, you've got to be committed. You have to be, recommit yourself. You've got to say, Lord, I'm going to do this thing again. I'm dedicating my life to you again. We've got to resist this world that's out there. The Bible says to love not the world. The world is all around us. The world system. Why is that? Because it's impossible to love God and the world. It's impossible. But just like it's impossible to serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. You cannot love God and the world. You can't love God's system and the world's system. And God's system seems so remote, and the world system seems so accessible. It's just out there. Love not the world. 1 John 2.15 goes on to say, neither the things that are in the world. Don't just love... Don't just not love the world, but don't love the things that are in the world. You can't love the world or the things in the world. Don't love the system or the things the system produces. And how many times do we just want a piece of the things that the system produces? I just want to be, I just want some of that. If you put all your treasure in the things on the earth, where do you think your heart will be? You think it'll be in the heavenlies? It won't be. Luke 12, 34 says, where your, heart is, where your treasure is, there will be heart also. And this is what the Lord is concerned about. The Lord is concerned that if you love the world, you will not love him. 1 John 2, 15 goes on to say, if any man love the world... The love of the Father is not in him. This could be translated that the love for the Father is not in him. If you love the world, the love for the Father is not in you. A person can't love the world system and God's system at the same time. These, these, these oppose each other. And when a Christian's love for the world, when a Christian's love for the world replaces their love for God, it's very dangerous. And can I say this too? It's very contagious. If, if you have a young Christian out here, who, uh, who a, a young fellow who just got saved, just trusted Christ as their Savior, oftentimes they're very excited, which in and of itself is contagious. And then they look at you, the mature Christian, and they say, boy, this is the model Christian right here. This is how you live your life to the glory of God. And you have a love for the world? Do you think that they're going to just 
innately develop a love for God when they see the Christians around them just loving everything about the world and the world system? That's contagious. You know, I, I tell you, the love for the world is like a cancer that just spreads, and it spreads and it infects, it infects other Christians. I just want a piece of the world. That's all I want. I just, I, 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 I just, I just want to own something for myself. And they, and and the storyline flips. They, they would rather have silver and gold than to have Jesus. The very friendship of this world puts you as an enemy with God. People say, "Well." Well, I, I, why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends with the world and with God? James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is, is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Friends, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. And there's a lot of Christians that say, well, I can have some worldliness and some godliness, and it doesn't work that way. They are, they, are, they are diametrically opposed. They, they, they work against each other. God's system is different than the world system. And there are Christians out there who say, well, I just want a little bit of world and a little bit of God. I think, well, maybe that makes the perfect, that makes the, it's kind of like a goulash, you know? Mix a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you know what you end up with? You end up with carnality. You don't end up with a thriving Christian you end up with a carnal Christian. A Christian who is spreading his cancer to the Christians. Now, we need to live in this world, right? I mean, tomorrow morning, a lot of you will, will go out and you'll work in the world system, in the cosmos. You'll be working with other people who are unsaved. You're going to be working with maybe even saved people who aren't where they should be spiritually. So you have to be in the world, just not of it. But it's attractive. It's seductive. It has an allurement to it. It's hyp hypnotic. It's you want part of what the world has to offer. It's very dangerous. The reason that Christians, now the reason that the Christian is not to love the worldly things is because it produce, it, it's produced by the world's system which is in direct opposition to God. Don't love the world, neither the things in the world, for if a man need love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. So don't love things that God opposes. Look at verse 16. What is not to be loved, right? He goes into this list. Here are some things not to love about the world. Verse 16, for all that is in the world. That's pretty inclusive, isn't it? Kind of like all that's there in the world. And then he gives this list of three different things. The lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. All of these things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he, Let's start out with the lust of the flesh. These are things that the flesh craves. We all have uh, fleshly cravings that are, are not right. Uh, this would be anything that is pleasurable to the flesh. And, uh, and there's a lot of fleshly pleasure out there. There's sensuality. There's, uh, there's gluttony. I don't know how many of you ate too much this afternoon. You gluttons you. And uh, I know I ate too much. It feels good for a moment until you're not feeling well. But really, man is about pleasure, isn't he? You see, we are about pleasure. We are about what feels good. We want the things that make us feel good. It's dangerous. 
In Psalm 81, 10 to 12, it says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Can I tell you this this morning, or this evening, actually, friends, unless you got a nap this afternoon, then it could be the morning for you. One of my fears is that God will give me the things that I lust after. I pray to God he doesn't give me the things I lust after until I pray that I have the things I lust after. It should be a fear of yours. That God doesn't give you the things that you want. I've said before, I think that maybe the way God judges us is by allowing us to have our own way. Fine, you want to do it that way? It's not my way. My ways are higher than your ways. You take the low road. That's fine. And you get yourself stuck. The lust of the eyes, these are, are things we, we see uh, that are not to be desired or are desired wrongfully. The lust of the eyes. These are things that are wrongly desired. Friends, I, there's no secret. This is why I don't go to the beach. You want to go to the beach? Go to the beach. It's fine. I can't handle the beach. I don't go to the beach. I have enough trouble with my eyes when I'm not at the beach. Why would I go and make provision for my flesh, right? These are the lusts of the eyes. It's the wrongful desires. We, it's kind of a funny thing, but my kids, they, we get these, uh, these advertisers in the mail. And, uh, and my kids, they, 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 they open them up. Look at Josh is smiling. Because they, they, the, they get the gimmies. You know, they, they see all of the things that they never knew existed, but the things they believe they need, you know? Like, well, I need one of those. And <laughs> so they open up these advertisements. We're really quick to throw them away. We try really hard, and they try to rescue them from the trash. And, uh, and it's just like a, it's a, it's a covetous magazine, the Menards and Harbor Freight. Uh, well, there's actually this one that we get around Christmas time. What's the name of that magazine we get? It's like, it's just like, Toys Central. It's like we, got a, we get a Toys R Us catalog or something. And man, the kids, they just, they just look at them and look at them and they just lust after it and they want it so bad. And, and, uh, and finally, we just we have to you know, just throw it away, we have to hide it. Sometimes we have to hide the, the advertisers even of food you know, because there's a lust for that even. This is where Eve stumbled. She, she saw it, she desired it, she took it. This is where Achan fell. We talked about David. We talked about David. If he would have been doing the things he should have been doing, he wouldn't have been seeing the things he was seeing. And because he saw what he saw, he had the lust of the eyes. The sword never departed from David's house. And then, of course, we have the pride of life. The pride of life. Oh, how we are all drawn into this. One commentator said that this is the vain display of earthly life. The vain display of earthly life. This is the look what I have. This is the pride of life. Look at, look at what I own. How many of you have gotten something and you just can't wait to show somebody? You just are so excited about the thing that you have. The pride of life is the arrogance over the possession such as money and houses. Look at my house. Look at my car. Look at my life. It's just, it's just amazing. Look at all the things that I have. Aren't I an amazing person? This is the pride of life. I think this is an area we all struggle with at times. We all want to show people that we have the latest and greatest. And sometimes we even work it into the conversation, don't we? We try to figure out a way to sneak in that I got a new whatever. Or I, look, look at what I own now. We all struggle with this. And the Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Be careful lest you fall, God might take that away from you. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. All this stuff is of the world. But yet we want it so bad. We, 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 we have this flesh that lusts against the Spirit. We have this, we have this, uh, this internal conflict, don't we? Between what, wanting what's good and godly and wanting what's, what's worldly. 1 John 2.17 says this, And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. The things of this world are not eternal. The world system will not last. The world system will go away. All of these things that you think you work so hard to accumulate, you can't take with you. The riches we have in, in heaven are so much better. They're just further out there. Nothing will matter in the end. Your business, your house, your money. John exhorts the mature Christian to love what will remain and forsake that which is already in the process of passing away. Set your affections on things above. I want to note this. Because worldly sin is only pleasurable for a season. And we want to produce our temporal experience. We're like addicts, aren't we? We're like addicts when it comes to wanting the things of this world. We have to go back for more. It's like, uh, it's like the dog that returns to his own vomit. We're a fool. Going back to our folly. And so we're like addicts. We just want it again, and we want it again. And we have to keep going back to the world to get more of what the world has to offer, which is temporal which is already in the process of passing away, which gives no long-term gratification anyway, which you can't take with us. We're like addicts. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. We're like a slave. I hate that. Don't you hate being a slave to sin? I'm so thankful that we're redeemed, we're bought with a price, we no longer have to be a slave to sin, but you know what, oftentimes we turn to back to our slavery, don't we? And that's a shame. It's a shame that, that the world is so captivating to us. And all of the things in the world, I just can't wait to have more of the world. The verse goes on to say, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I tell you what, an abiding relationship is based on an obedient relationship. We're not talking salvation. We're talking fellowship here, friends. Abiding in the vine. But we're talking about fellowship. Walking as he walked. 1 John 2.6 He that saith he abideth in him, if you say you abide in him, if you say that, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. If you say that you are abiding in Christ, walk as Christ walked. He was not, he was not loving the world. He was, in a sense, condemning the world. We have a long way to go in our spiritual journey, don't we? It's amazing how much the world influences the Christian. It's, it's really a shame when we look at all the world has to offer and we want it so bad. But God says, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And the Christian oftentimes finds themselves migrating right back into the world, whether it's the music, whether it's the TV shows, whether it's just whatever pollution that's out there. Why are we so eager to have what the world has? You know what, because we're eager to have what the world has, oftentimes the world is not eager to have what we have. They say to us, see, we have it better than you do. 
You want what we have. It's amazing. You find this conformity, this church that's conforming to the world. Of course the world's not going to conform to the church because we're doing the molding. The world is passing away. And I'm so thankful I know my Savior, aren't you? What does it really have to offer us? Sadness? Levels of sorrow, regret, shame, hate, anger, covetousness. But God has everything to offer us. Love and hope and happiness and joy, contentment, peace. So, such, a, such a stark contrast. And yet, the world is so powerfully influencing us to turn to it. That's a huge adversary. I mean, we know the devil is the adversary. And as a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And you know how he's using? He's using the world to get to us. He's using the world to turn the head of the Christian towards ungodly things. We have to be careful of that. We want to walk in the light as he is in the light. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 